Sabbath, M I N sin. Sabbath, M I N sin. And so I'll explain more as we get into it. But again, this is one of these topics that the Lord has said you gotta share it with them. They must hear these things. The church must be strengthened in these things. With that being said, let's take a moment to pray and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, to be in your presence, God, to experience you. God, it's so wonderful, you know, when our hearts are right before you, it never becomes a show. It becomes the simple moments of just experiencing who you are. And when we lay down all the things that are going on in this life, we can receive all that you have for us. Thank you, Father, for teaching us this biblical fear of you. Thank you for all that you've done. And now, Lord, as we move into this message, Lord, on Sabbath, I pray you bless it. Holy Spirit, would you give us understanding? And we know that understanding only comes from you. So release that today over your word, over your people, over this house in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you would bring encouragement and conviction, strength and peace, and always understanding of your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So to get started, to get started, let me ask you this question, or let me just begin this way. You know, in this life, there's all kinds of work. If you think about it, there's people who work with their hands, there's people who work from behind a keyboard, there's all different kinds of work. There are doctors, there are teachers, there are mechanics, there are farmers, there are people who do all kinds of work. Some people might even say that work makes the world go round. Now, we know that God is sovereign and God is over all things, but work... When somebody is doing one thing, somebody else is doing one other thing, and together things fit together, and, and things happen in this life. Work, work. See, we can find satisfaction in work, and we can also enjoy the fruits of our labor. But I ask you this, where did work originate? Where did it come from? God worked first, and he modeled it for us. You see, in the beginning of the Bible, we learn about the creation story. We learn about how God created the heavens and the earth. We, we come to understand that there was darkness and then the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. We learn that God created. We learn that God worked. God worked. He made the lights. He divided the day and the night. He made the land and the water, the plants, the trees, the vegetation, the animals, mankind. All in six literal days. I want us to understand this. As believers, as Christians, we don't believe a model that, that says that there was just some type of cosmic boom. Or we don't believe that there was, there, there was something that took billions of years to come to be. No, the Bible says that God did this in six literal days. So as believers, if God's word says that, that's what we believe. God did it in six literal days and then the bible says this in genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 and so the heavens and the earth were completed and all their heavenly lights the heavens being the sky the earth being the lands the vegetation the oceans the animals the people and the heavenly lights being the sun the moon the stars all these things verse 2 by the seventh day god completed his what his work could we say that a little bit? Somebody say his work. his work. His work. Which he had done. And he rested. Someone say he rested. he rested. On the seventh day from all his work. Which he had done. Verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because on it he rested from all his work. Which God had created and made. So what we're talking about is seven literal days, six days of work, one day of rest. I'm going to tell you, family, this topic is extremely important for the people of God. We must get this, understand the meaning of it, understand the significance of it, understand what God is trying to speak to us and why he did this and modeled this for us. 
Now, the truth is many struggle with this topic. That's the truth. Everyone likes the idea of it, but we struggle with it. But I'm telling you, God has a message for you today, to you and I. Now, there are many who are not living like God blessed and made holy the seventh day. They ignore it. They say stuff like, I'll rest when I go to heaven. Or they'll say, I just have too much to do. I don't have time to rest. Rest is a waste of time. Everything all right? <laughs> you know who would say stuff like that? Me. Me. The truth is we all have, whether by word or action. Maybe you didn't say it with your time. Maybe you, maybe you didn't say it with your words that rest is a waste of time. I'll, I'll rest when I sleep. But you say it with your actions. Listen, let me give you something a little extra here. God has a system. God loves systems. God uses systems. God implements systems. You can discover the systems of God throughout Scripture and in His creation. So God has systems. If you look at the beginning of creation all the way from Adam to Abraham, you have 2,000 years. If you look at Abraham to the time of Christ, you have another 2,000 years. How are we doing so far? 4,000 years, right? If you look at the time of Christ to where we're at now, another 2,000 years. That's 6,000 years that have taken place. You see, the devil came and met Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Jesus calls him the God of this age. Satan has been ruling this world for 6,000 years, and the time is about to expire. You see, the Bible speaks of a 1,000 millennial reign, which would complete 7,000 years. Church, this is so, so important that we begin to prepare for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is telling us that this seventh day matters. There's something that every believer must get. God worked six days and rested on the seventh, but he didn't just rest. The Bible records that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now, why is this significant? What does this mean? You see, when God blesses something, he releases his favor over it, making clear his presence is with it. Now, you all have seen the blessing of God in your life in one way or another. You've seen God open that door. You've seen God heal you. You've seen God provide for you. You've come into a worship service and you've experienced his presence. All of you have experienced the blessing of God in one way or another. All of you have. You see, when you have the blessing of God, when you have this evidence, you know one thing. You know that God is with you. Can you say it with me real quick? God is with me. He is. And I'm, you must receive that over your life today. And I don't know about you, but I want more of him. I want more of his presence. I know that in his presence, that's where the freedom is. I know that in his presence, that's where I'm going to find the peace, the joy, the satisfaction. That's where I'm going to be filled up to go and be able to conquer and do all the things that I need to do. It's in his presence. I want more of him. I want God's blessing. It is so easy to grab a hold of things and try to bless ourselves. That's not God's blessing. That's you trying to do what you, but I'm not talking about you doing what you can control and you do. I'm talking about you allowing God to bless you. And so God blesses the seventh day and he also sanctifies it. You see, to sanctify something means to make it holy. God said, not only am I going to rest, but I'm also going to bless this day off. When you partake it, partake in it, you are partaking into what God has blessed. You are partaking in what God has sanctified. You see, when something's holy, it's to be respected. Holy things are to be respected. 
to be treated careful, cautious, uh, received in a lovingly manner. Have, has somebody ever given you, have somebody, maybe they had a baby and they placed a baby in your hands and you're, you're holding it, you're holding it cautiously, carefully in a, in, a, in a loving way. God is giving you, God has given you the Sabbath and he's saying, hold it carefully, cautiously, receive it in a loving way. God, I receive what you have for me. You see, in the Ten Commandments, which everyone doesn't always think of as uh, something lovingly that I receive, God gives to Moses, Moses gives to the people. And God said, with the fourth commandment, he says this in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. He says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Remember, remember, remember. He says, he says remember. In other words, do not forget that God worked six days and rested on the seventh. Do not forget. Do you know what's the evidence of you actually remembering something? You actually respecting something? You actually having reverence? I told you, we, we are to respect holy things. So if you are to truly remember that God did this and God gave it to you, do you know what the evidence of that is that you actually doing it? If you actually do it, it is evidence that you're actually doing that verse. You actually remember what he's done. So whether you do your job at work five days and one day you do work things around the house, that's six days of work. Or, or, or your job is six days because you got all this work that you got to do and then you find time to, to work on things around your house or projects or whatever it is that you got to do in the evenings or in the mornings or different times. But there must be one day where there's no work around your house. Where there's no work that you have to do. Verse 10. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. To Him. It is a Sabbath day to him, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, or your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. No work on the Sabbath day. No house projects, nothing that is considered work. Well, pastor, I really enjoy this type of work. It's kind of like it's not work. No, work is still work. If I were to ask you another way and say, well, is it rest? The answer would be no. If it's not rest, then it's work. Verse 11 says this, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. God is saying no work. He's saying one day a week, no work. No catch up. Well, it's just because I, I, I got a little bit behind, so I got to catch up. I got to get this done. No, it, you, you got to trust him. What I'm telling you, family, today is this. When you choose not to take a Sabbath, what you're doing is not trusting him. You're not trusting him with your work responsibilities. You're not trusting him with the, with, the, with the school requirements. You're not trusting him with your finances. It's because, Pastor, you don't know. i got to provide for my family, so i I, I got to work. What you're doing is not trusting God with your family. Well, well it's, it's, just, it's just, Pastor, i got all these responsibilities at work. You're not trusting God with your job. You're not, you're not trusting God. You're trusting you. That's who you're trusting. You're trusting in you. It's not in God I trust. It's in me I trust. You must trust the Lord. Here's what I want to tell you. If you will actually take this day off, the, the human thinking is, I'm going to be behind. God's way is that you're actually going to get ahead because he takes care of your need. He, he, he'll work it out for you. Somehow it's going to work out. I can't see that because you're thinking humanly and you're not trusting God. So the question is, 
are you and I, are we breaking God's law? Let me, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. Are you in sin? Are you in sin? He is requiring you to rest. In fact, it's a command. Stop working and rest. One day, every week. Not too long ago, I was having a conversation with the board of directors here at the church, and we were got into a conversation on the Ten Commandments. And we're kind of talking through that a little bit. And, and then I spoke up and I said, well, board, I got to tell you something. The truth is nine of those commandments, I'm doing really well. And they all kind of looked at me and they said, well, pastor, this is kind of a big deal. We need to know which of the one you're not doing. <laughs> yeah. Are you still good to pastor the church? <laughs> What's going on? And I, I had to confess with them that it's, it was number four. This was a conversation we had last year. It's number four. Taking a Sabbath. The Lord asks it. He commands it. Take a day off. Do it. I'm going to explain some of the benefits. I'm going to talk about some of those things a little bit. But I need you to get this. He says, I need you to trust me. Take a day off. I did it. I modeled it for you. Now I'm commanding you to do it. And I need you to trust me with it. The truth is, for me, it had been a battle for a long time, a real struggle. I'd switched days off several times. My new day off now is Mondays. I try to just be off, even turn off the phone, just be off on Mondays. You know, the church gives me four weeks off a year. I have never had the full four weeks off, except for the one year I had a sabbatical. I have never had the vacation time, the full four weeks off ever. I, there's been Sundays where I don't preach, but that doesn't mean that I'm not working all week. This year I've already taken one week off, and I got three more that I'm going to fit in this year. And I'm, and I'm also requiring this of all of our staff. That they, they take time off. But it's not just about vacation time. It's about a weekly Sabbath. We must honor the Lord with a weekly Sabbath. And so I had to come before the Lord in repentance. That's the truth. I'm going to be honest. This was confession. I need you to understand that God puts adultery, murder, stealing, and Sabbath all together. Do you understand? This is huge. Are we in sin? I had to come before the Lord and repent. I'm being honest. Ask him to forgive me. Because I have broken this command many times. God modeled it. Then gave the Ten Commandments. See, the fourth commandment wasn't just like, oh, God's like, oh, I got nine. I need to throw an extra one in there. That, that, that's not what he, I know some of you try to make a list before. I just need one more. I don't know. Anybody, tell me something. I'll put that on my list. This was not that. He has it at number four. Honoring God with the Sabbath does three things. Number one, it honors God. That's a beautiful place to be. Number two, it gives you rest. Very, very important. Number three, it blesses your obedience. I've already said this before, but I need you to get it again. It's in your obedience that you receive the blessing of God. And I don't know about you, but I want the blessing of God. It's in my obedience. I have to do the right thing. In the right thing, I'm blessed. In my own thing, that's not what God is asking me. That's, that's not, I'm trying to bless myself. It's an obedience that I'm blessed. Pastor, you don't know my situation. I have to work seven days a week to make it. These are my responsibilities. You don't understand, Pastor, my day off is the only day that I can get stuff down around the house. Could it be possible that you don't trust God with provision and rest? Could it be possible that you don't trust God with your job? You don't trust God with your family. You don't trust God with your finances. You don't trust God with, with, with the things that are on your task list. You do not trust him. 
What I'm saying is that if you are not trusting God to meet your needs in six days, then you're missing what he has because trust is everything. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, he says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Our own understanding sometimes gets us in huge trouble. It's so easy to depend on your own understanding. You know, I will rest later. What happens? Later doesn't come. I'll rest at night when I'm sleeping. That doesn't trust God. That doesn't honor him. We are called to trust him even with rest. In Psalms 37, 5, the psalmist says, Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Would somebody say that with me? God will help me. Receive that over your life today because he will help you. He will absolutely 100% help you, but you got to do your part. There's always God's part. God will take care, but he's looking for you to do your parts. What's your part? You got to commit your work to him. God, you gave me this job. God, you gave me this family. God, you gave me this opportunity to get this education. God, you gave me these things. I'm going to trust you with what you gave me. I'm going to trust you that you never intended for me to violate what you have modeled and what you have asked of me by what you gave me. Does that make sense? So I commit my responsibilities to him. I trust him with my finances, time, results. He will help you. That's his promise. Receive his promise over your life today. You just have to do your part. Well, pastor, when's the Sabbath? Well, historically in Jewish culture, the Sabbath would have been from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, really making it Saturday. People were not allowed to... Uh, to, to gather food or gather wood or, or, or cook food or anything like that. Meaning the day before the Sabbath, they had to do all the gathering of the wood. They had to do all the cooking of the food and make enough extra so that on the Sabbath, they weren't actually doing any work. That means they weren't allowed to sell any items in commerce. They, 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 they weren't in it. All work had to stop. The idea behind the Sabbath is that it would be a sign of your relationship between you and God. There would be some type of sign, some type of evidence, and the sign of the relationship was you taking one day to stop every week. As you took this day to stop, it was evidence, it was the sign of your relationship with him, of your trust in him. Unless there was an emergency, that was the day off. The problem is, when God instituted this to the time of Jesus, this had become abused. In fact, perverted, if you will. All kinds of religious leaders added all kinds of things on top of it and, and, and ma- it made it very, very religious. The Pharisees had turned this gracious gift that God had given into, into something legalistic and punishing people who, 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 who did anything in the slightest by, by picking up something in their house to move it from over here to there, that they would be punished. That was not God's intention. That was not God's intention at all. You see, the religious leaders at the time of Jesus, they constantly gave him a hard time about it. The last passage that I want to read to you today is in Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. It says this, On the Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now you can see some of the things that the religious leaders had made on top of it and made things legalistic. But they weren't working. They were walking through the grain fields. As they were going on their journey, they grabbed some grain, some some heads of, of, of grain, and they were hungry, and they ate them. This is what they were doing. Now, I I always like to think through what is somebody thinking about when they're saying it. You know, I I just I I use the different hermeneutical tools to interpret scripture. and, and, And I and I came to the place of possibly these Pharisees were taking Exodus 34, 21, and they were they were possibly taking this passage out of context. 
Have you ever seen somebody take a passage out of context and use it and try to say that this is God's word, but that's not actually what it's saying? And so possibly these Pharisees, as they're speaking to Jesus, they're possibly taking Exodus 34, 21, and they're taking it out of context, and they're trying to charge Jesus and his disciples for walking through a grain field and taking these grains, these, these heads of grains and eating them when they're hungry. So Jesus comes back with them in a, in a passage from 1 Samuel 21, and he says, he answered, have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. There are some who look at a passage like this and say, well, you know, David was a man of God. He was to be king. You know, it was fine that he took the consecrated bread. What I want you to understand is that the consecrated bread was only meant for the high priest. So it wasn't for you to anybody to just to come and to take. But not only did David grab some, but he gave some to his men. What was going on? They were in a desperate situation and they were hungry. So Jesus is refuting these Pharisees that are potentially taking Exodus 34, 21 out of context and trying to use that against Jesus. And Jesus is like, listen, you're not getting it. You do not understand. God has created the Sabbath. Look at Jesus' words next. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Meaning God instituted this, modeled it, commands you to do it for your own benefit. This is your blessing. This is the gracious gift of God in your life. And when you do it, you will find the blessing of God in your obedience. He'll take care of the job situation. He'll take care of the finances. He'll take care of the family. He'll take care of the education. He'll, take, he'll work it out. But he has instituted it for your blessing. This is for you to receive. This is for you to own. This is for you to trust the Lord with. And in that, you'll find the blessing. In that, you'll find what God has for you. I want you to understand. See, when Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, that's God's blessing. The man for the Sabbath, that's the, the, the legalistic religion. I don't want you to take this message today and make it legalistic and make it religious. I want you to take this and understand, receive the blessing of God for your life and rest. Rest. Sabbath was given as a gift for refreshment, three areas. Number one, spiritually. God always wants you to be refreshed spiritually. Second, mentally. Get your mind clear. Third, physically. Rest the body. When is my Sabbath? A day you choose that you can be consistent with every week. Consider Sundays. If you already come on Sunday and you come to receive the word, consider the rest of this day just to be. Don't do any work. I know some of the fellas, listen, pastor, you don't know. My wife gave me this honey-do list, and I got to get these things done. Not on your Sabbath. Find some other time. You could always make time. You have time for whatever you make time for. That's the bottom line, the truth. In this life, you have time for what you make time for, period. The rest of it is, it's, it's, it's really comes down to just trusting him. Trust him. Trust him and take a day. What can I do on the Sabbath? Rest. Maybe have some family time. Break some bread. Do something good. Receive from God. Worship. Prayer time. Bible reading. Personal worship. You know, Sundays aren't supposed to be the only time that you worship God. You know, come to have on your Sabbath. Get some time or uh, even time throughout your week. Put on some, get a playlist going. And just worship God. Just, just have some time, you and him. Family, I just want to close with this. We can do this. 
we can absolutely do this. How do we begin? How do we begin? Repentance. Ask God to forgive you for not faithfully taking time to honor him with the Sabbath. Plan out your next Sabbath and follow through. As part of the challenge here, just repent, plan, and follow through. That's it. Repent, plan, and follow through. I've said this several times, and I'm going to say it again. There is nothing God cannot do with somebody who's humble. When you are full of pride, you say, that's not for me. I can't, that's not for me. You'll never receive the blessing of God. There's nothing God cannot do with somebody who's humble. All right, I receive that. God, I recognize the error of my ways. Forgive me, and I repent. I don't want to do that anymore. I, I want to honor you with this. That heart, that life, God can do it. God can do it. You want to see the next miracle in your life? Trust Him with the Sabbath. Let me take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the time to be in your house, and I thank you for your presence. You are so, so, so good. Father, you're teaching us some things, and that's wonderful. Continue to lead and guide us. Father, last week's message, I think, was so pivotal in understanding all of this, that we must have this personal, biblical fear of you and understanding that the only way to get invited to the table is to have this reverence for you. Father, I love you and I thank you. I know this church loves you. We love you. And today we come before you, Father, and we ask that you would forgive us. We ask, God, that you would help us to trust you by honoring you with the Sabbath. We repent. We want to leave that lack of trust behind us and we want to step into trusting you in a greater way. So we repent. Father, would you help us? Will we get out of our human thinking and trust you at your word, trust you at your promise? Bless this house, Father. Bless this house. May we be a church that is ready for your coming. May we be a church that you can trust to do your will. Help us, Father. Thank you for pulling us out of the pit where you found us. Thank you for healing us, giving us hope and a future, loving us. Oh, Lord, we've been met by a love that changes everything. In fact, if, if you're here today and nobody's looking around here, just for a quick moment, if there's somebody here, you say the truth is, I have not been right with God, or, I say, or you say that I, I have not really been a, a Christian. I cannot say that I am genuinely following the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's you today and you say, if God can forgive me, then I want to be forgiven from all my sin, and I want to truly become a Christian, and I want to truly follow the Lord Jesus, I'm ready to let go of my whole old life, and I want to just follow the Lord Jesus with my life. If that's you, would you quickly just put your hand up and then down. Is there anybody here this morning? I see one hand. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else? I see your hand. Thank you so much. I see your hand. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Three of us. Thank you so much. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, thank you. Father, forgive us for our sins, all of it. God, we repent. We we just don't want to live that lifestyle anymore. We want to leave that all behind and walk with you and be a Christ follower and truly follow you and truly follow your ways. Would you be with us? May your mercy and grace be over us. May your forgiveness be over us. May we receive the gift of eternal life. May, may, our, may our salvation be solid, Lord. May we walk with you hand in hand, God. Bring a peace over us, Father. Break chains in Jesus' name. There's so many things that you want to do in our lives going forward. Help us to receive all of that, Lord. Bless this house in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.